Okay, it's 8.01, so I think we can start now. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the University of Washington Division of Rheumatology <clears throat> Grand Rounds. A couple of reminders before we start. This session is being recorded and will be posted later on our website. And there will be a Q&A session at the end, so please add your questions in the Q&A feature below so that it's easier to moderate. And now I'll let Dr. Sabo introduce our speaker for today. Great. I'm so thrilled to introduce Megan Close, um, Associate Professor of Medicine, and I just learned the brand spanking new ch uh, Chief of Division of Rheumatology at Duke University. Uh, she's a very impactful expert on reproductive rheumatology. I've been following her and attending her talk since I learned about her work during my fellowship. <clears throat> As a reminder, um, after the session, Dr. Close generously offered to conduct a clinical discussion with audience participation for all of us to attend. Uh, this will take place on a separate Zoom link that I put in the chat. And some of our high-risk OB colleagues have been included so that we can all have a nice conversation together. Thank you so much, Dr. Close, for the important work you do and for being here to enlighten us. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the invitation. I wish that I was um, in Seattle with you. I actually came out with my family for the first time this summer um, and we had a really great trip, but um, it turns out since um, I just became the chief that this would have been a bad week for me to leave and fly across the country. So I guess this is more convenient. So today we're going to talk about um, pregnancy prevention and planning for women with rheumatic disease. And we're really going to focus on women with lupus because um, women with lupus, um, as I'm going to show you, really have sort of the biggest um, challenges. And um, if you can do this with lupus, you can do it with anything. So um, that's really where we're going to focus. My mouse is being weird, which isn't great. It's not a good sign. I like my own. Okay. Um, all right, these are my disclosures. So today what we're gonna talk about um, are two main things. First, we're gonna really focus on catastrophic pregnancies. I'm gonna tell you what, how I'm defining them um, and why it's important to avoid them and who has them. Next, we're gonna gain skills that promote honest and accurate conversations about pregnancy planning and prevention with the goal of limiting catastrophic pregnancies. And um, I really look forward to the second hour to you in which we can really kind of get into the nitty gritty of how to um, actually do that. So um, I have one slide in general on lupus, so systemic lupus erythematosus, often on slides it's called SLE, almost out loud I almost always call it lupus because I don't like acronyms. Um, and as many of you know, obviously lupus is kind of the quintessential autoimmune disease um, from a rheumatology standpoint. It's most, co most commonly affects women between the ages of 15 and 44, so smack in their reproductive years. It's why pregnancy is such an important component of the care of patients with lupus, because many of them have not had children by the time they get diagnosed, unlike people with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, who might get diagnosed in their 40s and 50s. 90% um, of the people with it are women, um, and uh, Black patients in the United States have higher rates of the disease as well as more severe manifestations classically. Um, and as you know, lupus can affect a whole range of organs, which makes it just a little bit more complicated than most of our diseases. Um, you know, skin joints are, are certainly what almost everybody has at least some component of that. But um, kidney disease happens with lupus nephritis in up to 50% of our patients at some point and can be particularly problematic in pregnancy, I'm going to show you. Um, so, you know, lupus, um, everybody's lupus is a little bit different. And so people have different risks in pregnancy because of that. So catastrophic pregnancies, you know, that's not really a, it's not really a scientific thing. Catastrophic pregnancy, I would argue, you know it when you see it. But the way that I would describe it is one that puts the mother and the baby at very high risk for complications. And to be honest, even if those complications don't come to fruition, um, just the experience of living through one of these exceptionally high risk pregnancies is very um, damaging, I think, for women and the entire family, men as well. So things that fall into this category, pregnancies in which the woman is at very high risk for pregnancy loss, especially stillbirth, um, patients who are at really high risk for very early deliveries, you know, before 32 weeks, for example, in which the baby is going to have to be in the intensive care nursery for many months and may have lifelong uh, consequences from their learning st uh, standing, emotional standing, uh, medical as well. And some of those babies don't ever make it out of the intensive care nursery. 
Um, babies who are at high risk for congenital malformations, particularly if that's due to a medication that the woman took, because I think that that certainly amps up the culpability of these uh, congenital anomalies in a way that I think it's hard for most of us to imagine the experience of that for women. When the woman's health or life is at significant risk, and I think you could argue that one that sort of puts significant emotional trauma to the mother and the family, which leads me to sort of the concept, which I think is an evolving and new one of reproductive trauma. So reproductive trauma um, is something that I think is coming to the forefront with more and more people talking about their miscarriages, for example, um, and talking about um, histories of abortion. But I think it's worth us remembering that when a woman walks into a catastrophic pregnancy that's very high risk, she is really, this is something that's gonna impact her whole life, I would argue. Um, so this is a, a lovely uh, systematic review of 13 studies of women and two of them included men following stillbirth, comparing their depression and PTSD scores to, uh, to people who had a live birth um, for two, from two months to three plus years after the um, delivery. So depression, all studies that looked at depression found increased rates of depression. And for both mothers and fathers, it's up to sixfold higher than people who have had a live birth. Um, and amongst mothers, it was higher amongst those who are unmarried. For PTSD, 60% um, of the mothers um, following a stillbirth met criteria for PTSD, which was four times higher than women who've had a live birth. Um, and that increased with young age, low income, and the first pregnancy. In addition, mothers who've had stillbirth, but also things like preterm births, fetal distress during pregnancy, scary things happen, have a significantly higher score on their post-traumatic uh, checklist. So I think it's worth remembering that it's not just actually the health outcomes that matter, um, but also the impact on women and men um, in the future. So we've begun studying this in the Duke Lupus Registry. The Duke Lupus Registry is um, a collection of over 450 pregnancies that we, or women, not pregnancies, uh, patients, actually men and women, that we see in our Duke Rheumatology Clinic who have lupus. And we often have them doing lots of surveys. And this is part of a large survey that we're currently doing. Uh, we're shooting for 300 um, results. We're currently not there yet, but we are um, over halfway there. So we um, have in there a, a, a trauma survey, right? So there is standardized trauma surveys asking about, you know, have, have you, did you um, have someone suddenly die who's close to you? Did you see somebody die? Did you have physical abuse when you were a child? That sort of thing. And um, we were all doing these surveys because that's how you get ready to do a survey as you do it yourself to see what the questions are. And when I got to the bottom of the trauma survey, what I realized was that the things in my life personally that had been most traumatic were my pregnancies. I had exceptionally complicated pregnancies um, and I have two uh, beautiful children who are for the most part great, all right? And, um, and my daughter, you know, is exceptionally challenging. She's 19 in college, she's fine. There's no ramifications to her from the pregnancy, but for me, it, it, it was terrible and it caused real trauma for sure. Um, so we developed a sort of, uh, we added survey questions to this um, for looking for potential reproductive trauma, Pre pregnancy loss and abortion, 31% of our patients reported having one of those, severe pregnancy complications, 19%, severe illness in an infant, 6%, and severe illness in a child, 11%. When we add all those together, 47% of our women report potential reproductive trauma events, and 27% of our men report them as well. And then we have other surveys in the whole big thing that look at things like anxiety, depression, fatigue, pain. And what we saw, interestingly, is that people with the product, uh, who had had reproductive trauma didn't really have increased anxiety or depression. But what we did see is that they were much more likely to be experiencing severe fatigue and um, twice as likely to be living with moderate to severe pain on an average day. So we, in our lupus world, we are focusing a lot on fatigue, achiness, and pain, and brain fog, and so on, and really see it as both an inflammatory component, but also as um, a trauma response, probably, for some of these patients. And I think that it's worth us um, remembering that reproductive trauma has lifelong consequences for our patients, both emotional and potentially physical. 
So I think abortion used to be viewed, at least um, in North Carolina, it used to be viewed, not so much anymore, as sort of a escape hatch for catastrophic pregnancies. And I think that let doctors sleep a little better at night, some doctors at least, that, well, if we walk in there, you know, if she's not on birth control, but she walks in there, then there is an option, right? And that is changing. Um, so prior to 1973, um, actually 30 states banned abortion, but things were beginning to get more liberalized. And then in 1973, the Supreme Court decided Roe versus Wade, in which they um, determined that liberty in the 14th Amendment protected individual privacy, which also means that the right to an abortion prior to fetal viability was also allowed, basically putting the decision in the um, hands of the pregnant individual and not the state. Then in June 2022, the Supreme Court reversed that decision with Dodds versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, basically concluding that liberty does not mean privacy and does not cover an abortion, and that turned the legality of abortion over to the states. And that has led to um, a lot of changes. Um, so there's a lot of variability in abortion laws right now. All of these deep red states have... Um, uh, essentially bans on abortion after six weeks, if not before that. Um, for example, well, Oregon, your neighbor, has no restrictions. I'm about to show you your restrictions, which are also minimal. Um, Georgia has a heartbeat bill in which a woman has to have a transvaginal ultrasound prior to having a termination. And if there is any kind of detectable pulsations, then she is not allowed to have an abortion. Um, there are exceptions for medical emergency there. Um, in Texas, it's a it's a interesting ban in that it's six weeks, um, and it's enforced with civil lawsuits as opposed to the doctor going to jail. Instead, the doctor will get sued and can't actually be sued by the government, but can only be sued by a family member of the aborted fetus. And up to five years after the termination, there is um, language about um, anybody who aids and abets the performance or inducement of an abortion. And who that is is not clear. And I can tell you that some rheumatologists in the state of Texas are worried that this applies to them. And I'm not sure they're entirely wrong. Unfortunately, um, all of these rules are um, pretty vague and I think are gonna have to be uh, worked out in the courts uh, with doctors getting sued. Missouri has a total ban. I was just recently there. They have the shortest bill I've read recently. Um, and anybody who knowingly performs an abortion at any time, um, it is a class B felony. Um, Abortion-inducing drugs, um, methotrexate generally falls into that category. Fortunately, most of these laws have wording in here that really make it clear that the intent of the prescriber matters. So if a rheumatologist is prescribing methotrexate and clearly they intend to be treating rheumatoid arthritis, um, but the woman has a miscarriage or the woman uses it purposefully to terminate a pregnancy, then the doctor is not culpable. On the other hand, if it's clear that you have written the methotrexate in order to help her terminate a pregnancy, that would get you in trouble. So in states where these things are happening, I'm definitely recommending that rheumatologists just put the ICD-10 code for what they're prescribing on the methotrexate prescription um, to help avoid any kind of problems. Um, I looked up the rules in the state of Washington and your website is lovely. Wow, and it's really clear, <laughs> unlike many other places. So abortions are legal up to the point of viability um, or to protect the life or health of the mother. There's no waiting periods. In North Carolina, we have a 72 hour waiting period where a woman has to get talked to in person and then wait 72 hours to, I don't know, think about it and then uh, is able to get it. Um, Anybody can get it at any age and has the right to consent for themselves. You don't have to be a state resident or citizen. Your state health insurance plans cover abortion services. Any public hospital that does any kind of maternity care also has to provide abortion care. Um, and uh, there's a, it sounds like this is a health program that does not cover abortion, but state uh, will cover it for them. So um, quite liberal laws, especially in comparison. Oh, my house is being very strange. Move. Come on. Hmm. It's not a great sign when your PowerPoint doesn't work on your own computer. There it is. Okay. So we're going to take a brief aside and I'm going to explain our pregnancy registry. So the MADRA pregnancy registry, um, MADRA stands for Maternal Autoimmune Disease Research Alliance, um, has been established here at Duke 
for um, about five years. We are in the process of um, expanding, hopefully in the next year or two. Um, it is a prospective consented registry of pregnant women with rheumatic disease. We started this one in 2018, though we actually have a 10-year um, data set before that as well in a differently named registry. All patients are enrolled in the Duke Autoimmune and Pregnancy Clinic, which um, is me basically on Mondays and has been for almost over 15 years. And now I've hired um, Cassie Sims, who is uh, one of our former fellows who has joined me and I've trained her to, to see patients with me. Um, we currently have about 450 pregnancies, about 100 a year. Um, it definitely dropped in the year of COVID until we could figure out how to do online, um, but we're now back up to 100 a year. Um, we have about 30% have lupus, about 28% inflammatory arthritis, like RA, JIA, et cetera. 26% um, are sort of, we have a lot of like UCTD, not really rheumatic disease, but has autoantibodies, that sort of thing. And then we have about 16% rare diagnoses like vasculitis, scleroderma, myositis. And these numbers have stayed really steady over the last 15 years. We collect a lot of data. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we have patient surveys at every single visit when they come to see me. I document their disease activity, their diagnoses. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out what medications people are actually putting in their body. And then we also pull data from the EMR, things like labs and vitals and um, pregnancy outcomes. We are careful about collecting those. And then we also have a sample repository. So we recently looked at um, abortion in our registries. What we found is of the 115 lupus pregnancies enrolled during this period of time, two had terminations. One, because a woman had a new diagnosis of severe pulmonary hypertension in the first trimester, she was probably at, at least a 50% chance of dying based on our estimations given the severity. Um, so she had a termination um, of a very wanted pregnancy. Um, and then we also had one terminate at uh, 13 weeks for trisomy 21. Out of 208 pregnancies um, that these 115 patients reported from prior, right? So they're previous pregnancies, of those 12.5% um, of them had been terminated per their self-report. Um, the majority were elective abortions, but almost 5% were terminated for medical reasons, according to the woman. So these are definitely happening in our lupus patients. So how do we identify these potentially catastrophic patients, uh, pregnancies with lupus? So first is just worth knowing that lupus pregnancies have higher rates of complications than other pregnancies. This is a state uh, data um, over about a 15 plus year period of time from the nationwide inpatient sample, which is in hospital um, admissions um, and data from about 20% of them across the country, and then you can extrapolate. But um, preeclampsia happens in about 10% of those pregnancies um, versus 4% in the general population. Um, and then um, non-delivery hospitalizations are also significantly higher in patients with lupus. Those are hospitalizations in the middle of pregnancy. Um, so we definitely see worse outcomes. Um, and this is really from our website, reprogram.duke.edu, and really our sort of overarching approach to pregnancy planning and success is that we start with a healthy mom. We do pregnancy planning. We make sure they're on pregnancy compatible meds and we control their disease. And that is what, in our experience and all the data suggests, is what gives us the highest chance of having a healthy baby at the end. So this is how we talk about it with patients because all my patient groups tell me that they want positive and they want hope, all right? However, we're doctors, so we think about the other side, right? So what we get worried about, and particularly these catastrophic pregnancies, they happen in moms who start off pretty sick usually. There's often a lack of planning I'm gonna show you. Often they're on incompatible medications or often no medications. And typically they have active disease or significant damage from their disease. And that's really where we're seeing most of our sick babies coming from. So we're gonna walk through the data that shows you kind of these different components. Come on, you can do it. Clearly need a new battery. <laughs> or something. Um, okay, so pregnancy um, outcomes and per particular pregnancy loss increases when women with lupus have very active disease at conception. This was actually data that I um, analyzed in my fellowship. Um, and what we showed was that um, very high rates of miscarriage and very high rates of stillbirth in women with active disease at conception or in the couple months before. Similarly, if they had active disease in the middle of pregnancy, we also saw increased uh, pregnancy loss 
and we saw increased live births. So these are people with very active lupus. So you might wonder sort of how active, what kind of activity. For years, we've just sort of been saying like, oh, active lupus, right? No flares prior to pregnancy is kind of like what the message is. But uh, having been doing this for quite a while, I, I would say that's not entirely true. And our data is backing that up at this point. So we looked at what type of lupus activity you had and um, how that impacted pregnancy outcomes. And what we saw was that um, it's the lupus nephritis activity that's really particularly problematic. And, okay, good. Um, so uh, the purple bar, the big one, the purple bar are patients with active lupus nephritis in pregnancy. And you can see that their rate of severe pregnancy outcomes um, and preterm birth, preeclampsia, um, and even loss after 13 weeks or 12 weeks are all significantly higher than women with inactive lupus. That's the pink one, we'll call it. And then the middle bar are people with active lupus, like quite active lupus, but not in their kidneys. So people with pretty significant skin disease, with pretty abnormal complement, double-stranded, arthritis, that sort of thing that you would call active lupus for sure, and you would be changing medications and so on. But those folks really seem to have um, actually quite good pregnancy outcomes. So then we looked at, well, is it, lup is it lupus nephritis in general? Like you're just sort of have the protoplasm of, of having poor pregnancy outcomes, or is it the activity? And what we saw looking at, a, we did a meta-analysis of three prospective lupus pregnancy registries in, the, in North America, Duke, Hopkins, and University of Toronto. And what we saw was that um, active lupus nephritis is really the problem. Um, if you had active lupus nephritis in this cohort, only um, about 30% had a live term infant without preeclampsia. Um, and you can see that the light blue bar is people with active lupus nephritis and clearly worse than the people with inactive lupus nephritis. In our experience, people with inactive lupus nephritis do have higher rates of preeclampsia, especially um, than um, patients who've never had lupus nephritis. So um, even our patients with um, very inactive lupus nephritis are at somewhat higher risk, but it's nothing like the risk of people with active lupus nephritis. So next we've studied interstitial lung disease as sort of an emblematic version of damage. Um, and what we did is um, a retrospective chart review. This was um, instigated after a fellow and I took care of an exceptionally ill patient with um, severe um, inter interstitial lung disease and lupus. And so we went looking for some data and found that there was practically none. Um, and so we did a, a large survey of um, almost 25 years worth of data here at Duke. We found 86 pregnancies in 60 women, which might not sound like a lot, but before this and actually still, the largest published um, study was 15 pregnancies. Um, so uh, many of them had sarcoidosis, but 30% uh, um, had a connective tissue disease, the majority of, or half of which were lupus. So first we looked at the severity of lung disease based on pulmonary function tests. And what we saw was um, it really depended on, you know, connective tissue disease patients here in purple were the people with definitely the more severe disease. And this very severe group we're going to see on the next slide, it's only seven pregnancies, but there are people with um, a DLCO or FEC less than 40% predicted, which is the number I'm going to want you to remember. And when we looked at pregnancy outcomes, what we see in that population was that over half had a pregnancy loss. Um, two out of the three live births uh, were delivered quite preterm. Um, whereas everybody else, I, I've condensed this to one, but you're just gonna have to trust me that all the rest of them had really shockingly consistent similar pregnancy outcomes. So even people who were in this severe like DLCO around 50% actually had quite good pregnancy outcomes. Preterm birth rate of 9% is smack dab right in the middle of what we would expect in the general population. So, um, as long as it's not severe and they don't actually probably have lots of other sort of comorbid connective tissue disease badness, um, then they often um, will do very well, which is great to know because um, I think women with ILD often are, are, are told not to get pregnant, but it doesn't seem like that's a problem. In, in addition, we had surprisingly good maternal outcomes. Nobody died. Um, only one person was intubated, um, and that was actually mid-pregnancy for an asthma flare for EGPA, and she did great at delivery. 
Um, there was one preterm induction for maternal pulmonary decompensation. That was this patient who started the whole thing. She couldn't breathe. She also had 11 grams of proteinuria and no albumin. So, um, and very poor lungs. So it was not surprising that she could not breathe around 30 weeks. Um, and only, and, and then four people did have this, um, sort of syndrome of volume overload following delivery. When you deliver a baby, um, you know, you go from having 50% excess blood. And then like a week or so later, you've diarrhea to the point that you're basically, you know, pretty close to normal. And so there's huge fluid shifts, huge fluid shifts when the placenta comes out and um, people with uh, pulmonary hypertension in particular. And I suspect um, these folks with ILD, some of them just don't have the cardiac and pulmonary reserve to be able to handle those huge shifts. So people who have significant ILD, we do, I like to try to keep them in the hospital for a little longer because these patients can look good for a day or two and then really um, practically die at home in my experience. So I try to um, fight with the OBs about keeping them in for a few extra days and diuresing them pretty aggressively. All right, so we've covered our active disease and um, controlled disease. Now we're gonna talk about medications. So um, you all know what um, most of the teratogens are in rheumatology. You might not sure, be sure that you know all of them, but I'm gonna hazard a guess that you probably do. So there are basically three medications that we prescribe on a, on, on a frequent basis that cause major birth defects. Um, so this is data from several different studies. I'll conglomerate it onto one slide so we can see it together. Um, but basically in general, um, and from the data from these studies, the you know control people, regular people, regular pregnant people, three percent risk of major birth defects. That's just the going rate in almost every study. Methotrexate, um, on the other hand, does have a somewhat increased risk for pregnancy or for major birth defects, um, around seven percent, um, and that's at rheumatology doses, not not cancer doses, but rheumatology doses about seven percent, so about twice the risk. Cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate, however, have much higher risks with about one out of four babies born with a major birth defect. And mycophenolate in particular causes facial abnormalities and microtia is the most common thing, which is a very abnormal ear in the infant, which I think you can see here, and that baby would be deaf. So these are not, you know, extra finger can be fixed in the hospital, no big deal. These are real um, lifelong, permanent, every time you communicate and look at your child, there it is. Um, kind of major birth effects. So I think um, this is important. And I think um, many women, and I think actually some physicians are not really fully aware of the risk of, of mycophenolate, um, which is really um, frequently used. In addition, um, all of these drugs cause increased pregnancy loss at about 40 to 50% with first trimester exposure. And sometimes that's early first trimester, but I've seen some of them pretty late. So we went looking to see how common these teratogens were in our rheumatology population. And we looked at the RISE registry, which is a national registry um, that collects data from about a third of the practicing rheumatologists, mostly in private practice. It's uh, managed by the American College of Rheumatology. We looked at all women ages 18 to 45 who had an ICD-10 code for rheumatoid arthritis or lupus and had a visit in 2018 with one of these rheumatologists. We used a, a long list of potential teratogens, methotrexate, mycophenolate, um, my, uh, mycophenolic acid, cyclophosphamide being the most common. These others um, were less common. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis, 38% um, of women in this age group were prescribed methotrexate that year. Um, in lupus, 14% were prescribed mycophenolate, 10% methotrexate. And interestingly, um, white women actually had uh, fewer teratogenic um, prescriptions than women of color. Um, and I suspect that that is related to disparities um, in prescribing be that, that's related to more white women being given biologics, which is a talk for another day. So in our pregnancy registries, um, in our uh, MADRA registry of those 115 pregnancies, um, eight or 7% of them um, were exposed to mycophenolate, which is much higher than I would like. Um, and then in a survey of US rheumatologists that some of you might've participated in last year that was based at the ACR meeting, um, half of the rheumatologists said that they'd had a patient with a teratogenic exposure in the past. So this is definitely something that we run into. I run into it obviously multiple times a year, but I suspect you do at University of Washington too. Um, 
When we looked at um, abortions in our pregnancy registry, um, I feel like we already talked about that. Sorry, I added that pretty slide and forgot to take out the other one. All right, so we're back here. So we've done controlled disease. We have done pregnancy uh, incompatible meds are problematic. So now let's look at pregnancy planning. So in our um, pregnancy registry, we actually now have people doing a survey when they um, enter the registry called the London Measure of Unplanned Pregnancy. It is one of my favorite surveys um, because it asks really insightful questions about how planned this pregnancy was. And then you get a score and you can tell, was it planned? Was the woman like ambivalent? Um, or was she like really trying not to get pregnant and here she is pregnant? Um, it includes things like, did you and your partner talk about pregnancy uh, before you got pregnant? And it's like, yes, we agreed to get pregnant. The middle would be like, we talked about it, but hadn't decided. And the last one would be like, we never talked about it at all, right? So, and there's other questions like that. It also includes a list of like uh, health behaviors, like changing your medicines. We added by talking to a doctor before you got pregnant, et cetera. So we used this one, calling it personally ready for pregnancy with 108 people had completed the survey. And what we can see is that 37% of them were not personally ready to be pregnant when they conceived. We also set up a definition for medically ready for pregnancy um, based on um, the ACR guidelines and data that we have. And that is that the urine protein to creatinine ratio is less than a gram um, prior to pregnancy or in the first trimester. Um, that she was not taking a teratogen and that she continued pregnancy compatible medications, primarily hydroxychloroquine and azathioprine in pregnancy. And for all 115 pregnancies, you can see that about 32% of them were not medically ready. And there is some crossover between these two groups, but not entirely, not entirely. So when we looked at uh, demographics and social determinants of health, we see that more women who were uh, ready to get pregnant, had fewer social uh, determinants, adverse social determinants of health. So race was not significant at all, um, but you can see that our not readies are here in the um, deeper colors and that many of our not ready patients um, uh, were single, many had less than a college degree, and many had a very low income in comparison, especially to those that were ready. So these are all things that um, when we look at the data of pregnancy outcomes also can impact uh, pregnancy outcomes. So then we looked at sort of how all the features of these things and how it, uh, how the pregnancy comes out. So first we looked at depression um, and this is depression when they first show up into the pregnancy registry. So usually sort of first trimester is when most people show up. Um, and uh, what we see in the people who were medically ready, yes or no, we actually didn't see a difference in depression, but personally ready, we definitely saw that patients who were not personally ready for pregnancy had higher rates of depression. Um, and the adjusted odds ratios are all adjusted for the social determinants of health. Um, medications indeed were, um, our patients who were not medically ready, um, um, or personally ready actually, had different um, medication experience and exposure and the early part of pregnancy. And I think actually both are potentially problematic. So people who are ready and planned, right? They just stayed on their hydroxychloroquine because they knew to do that ahead of time. On the other hand, our patients who were not medically ready or ready had not probably had the conversation often. And so just didn't even know what to do with it. And the knee jerk reaction of all women is to stop all medicines when they get pregnant. And if they don't show up to your clinic for a month or two, then they've been off their medicines for a month or two which is I think problematic and sets them up for flare. Also MMF, you can see that mycophenolate was much more common in our patients who um, were not ready, but you can see that um, there was a woman who uh, was ready to get pregnant and was planning on pregnancy and was still on mycophenolate when she conceived. Um, active lupus was more common in people who were not medically ready. Um, but not so much personally ready. And then preterm birth outcomes um, and preeclampsia were much higher in the people who were not medically ready, though interestingly, um, not significantly different for the patients who were personally versus not personally ready. So the personally ready stuff is what um, hits the emotional sort of uh, component of this, um, but the outcomes are really based on medical that we can see. All right, so that's why planning is so important, right? So. We know that every year, I suspect you see a few, and I see a few women who show up here in the blue area, right? And, and we wander through pregnancy with them as best we can. But my goal in this world is that we move these pregnancies up to the yellow, 
and that we limit the number of pregnancies that are happening down here in the blue by helping women who want to build families to move up to the yellow and get there before they get pregnant. So it's uh, for years, we've just been telling people, right? Oh, the medicines are important. No oh, activity is important, but we need to actually help them get there. Um, and that's part of our job, I think, as rheumatologists. So how do we do that, right? How do we do that? So I wanna uh, go with the hypothesis that increasing the number of honest and accurate conversations that you're having with your patients with rheumatic disease um, about pregnancy prevention and planning will be helpful. And what I mean by honest is that the woman feels able to be honest with you about whether she wants to get pregnant, whether she's using birth control. When we talk to patients, we know that they're not really comfortable with this conversation all the time and that they have either gotten lectures in the past that they don't want to hear again. They feel judged, particularly many of our women of color, I think, and feel judged by their rheumatologist and um, aren't sure if the reason that you're discouraging pregnancy is because of who they are or their disease. Um, and so they are hesitant to have these conversations. And they're also really afraid you're gonna tell them no for something that is exceptionally important to them. And then that you have accurate conversations so that you're able to give a patient um, the information that really applies to her so that she can make really informed uh, decisions. So to do that, we have developed what we call the hop step intervention, healthy outcomes in pregnancy with SLE through educating providers. It is our approach to improving um, pregnancy prevention and planning. And um, we would love to um, have you guys give it a try as well. So it's a three-step process. We've tried to make it as easy as possible. This is designed to be done in your rheumatology clinic. So the first thing to do is to ask. So you actually just have to ask women if they're interested in getting pregnant because you actually often can't guess. <laughs> um, it actually doesn't have to do with their demographics. Many women who are unmarried still like want to get pregnant right away. Um, and so you have to ask sort of to get a sense of where they are and then find out what her birth control is. And it's important that even if you have your MAs asking it or you have them answering it on a piece of paper that the rheumatology needs to, rheumatologist needs to be aware so that they can then incorporate that in what goes next. Next is discussion. So the rheumatology provider and the patient have a personalized and accurate conversation using our discussion guides, which I'm about to show you, that really try to walk you through the conversation in a way that gives you the answers and gives the patients the answers um, that she needs. And then share that clinical information in the chart so that the reproductive health providers who are gonna be doing the birth control or helping with the pregnancy um, know the things about lupus in particular that they need to know and wouldn't know otherwise uh, to be able to help with the patient. So first we have um, our contraception guide. If you use the QR code, you will end up um, at our website. What time is it? Okay, I'm doing all right. So um, the way that this works, since you guys are on screens, I actually will just do it here. But here's, um, if you go to the website, here's what our pretty website looks like. Um, and there's multiple ways to get to the handout if you, my, the way I always do it is I just go to preparing for pregnancy and um, the handout is here. We also have it in Spanish um, and it's updated by the ACR guidelines and so on. So it's right here. You guys can just print these out, um, use them in clinic as much as you want. All right, so I'm just gonna use this slide though. So the way that um, I use this and I use this in clinic a lot, a lot. <laughs> So we start up here at step one um, in which um, you're gonna sort of help the woman figure out which of the categories of uh, birth control she can use based on things that you know as a rheumatologist. So does she have really active lupus? In particular, proteinuria, I think is the most important thing, um, which puts her at increased risk for blood clots in particular. Does she have positive antiphospholipid antibodies? Um, and is she at high risk for blood clots, like she's had blood clots before, or you think she has some disease process that puts her at very high risk for blood clots, like um, active vasculitis, something like that. Then my goal is that you walk through this with her and um, maybe circle things and that she take it to her primary care doctor or gynecologist or whatever to do the next steps. I am not anticipating that a lot of rheumatologists are gonna start prescribing birth control. I rarely prescribe birth control myself, but, um, but that, you help the woman figure out sort of what her risk is, which also helps the reproductive health provider do the same. So the forms of birth control are here um, uh, in a list based on sort of most highly effective to the least effective, 
Highly effective birth control, also called long acting reversible contraception is the implant or Nexplanon or the IUD. These are shown to have exceptionally high um, effectiveness. Basically they work for the most part, unless somebody takes them out and that has to be taken out by a provider. So um, the rate of pregnancy um, with these is about uh, less than 1% of women per year. Tubal ligation and vasectomy seem to be making a comeback here in North Carolina, certainly since the abortion law changes. And um, I'm pleased to see it, particularly a lot of um, our spouses are now stepping up um, to help women um, avoid complications with birth control. Um, in the effective range are basically all the hormonal things that women have to do something about periodically, which just adds human error. If people did them perfectly, they would actually have um, efficacy very similar to an IUD or an implant, but nobody is perfect. Nobody can get to clinic exactly every 12 weeks forever, right? None of your patients, I'm sure, do that. Uh, I couldn't do that, right? Um, taking pills every single day, remembering to turn your patch over every week, that sort of thing. The mini pill is a progesterone only pill, and it is safe for all women with rheumatic disease because it does not increase the risk of uh, blood clots. However, it has the lowest effectiveness of these, and a woman actually has to take it at the same time every day, such that if she takes it at 8 o'clock every morning and forgets one day and takes it at 1 p.m., it might not be effective. Like, that's how sensitive it is. There is a new progesterone only birth control on the market, SLIND, I believe it's called with a Y. And um, it is does have a higher window so that you can, you know, be a normal human being and have it work. But um, but the mini pill is safe, but not as effective. And then we have our sort of list of, of in, <laughs> I probably shouldn't call them ineffective. It's not quite the point, but um, less effective things that really basically need to be done during sex, um, which makes them just less likely to happen. All right, um, next, um, so that's the pregnancy prevention component, right? So if you have a woman, she's not interested in getting pregnant right now, or um, she has medical issues that make it so it's very unsafe and you're sort of talking through the like, let's delay while we get things under control. That's who you do the pregnancy um, prevention and birth control and really help women walk through. I'm not sure I explained, but red X's mean that the women who fall into this category shouldn't get these. And that's basically, for the most part, it's these days, it's, and I'm hoping this red X from Depo Primera goes away, but it's mostly estrogen and birth, uh, estrogen and blood clots. That's really the main issue. Oh, I also forgot to add that emergency contraception um, is safe for all women with rheumatic disease. It is the most common one is the um, plan B or the morning after pill. It is not an abortion pill. If somebody already has an established very early pregnancy, it will not terminate that pregnancy because it is all progesterone and the hormone that is most <laughs> high at that point is progesterone. A little more won't make a difference. It needs to be taken within three days of having sex. It is available on Amazon with no prescription. So I actually recommend that our patients buy it ahead of time. If you have teenagers or young adults, maybe even have the parent buy it and just keep it in the medicine cabinet in case somebody needs it and you're just over the, um, the, the challenge of going and buying it. Um, it is, uh, there's also some other options. There's a prescription called Ella that works for women who are, um, uh, of a higher weight than plan B will work for. And then gynecologists can also put in an IUD up to five days after. All right, so then if you have a patient who says that she's interested in pregnancy, which uh, um, happens for sure pretty often, um, then it's time to walk through the pregnancy planning guide. The pregnancy planning guide is also on the website, just where I showed you. And um, I have it, uh, I use this a lot. I use this actually more than the contraception side. If you print it from the website, it's actually two-sided, which is convenient. Um, and uh, I have the boxes numbered and this is how I do it. You are welcome to steal how I do it. So what I do is I start up here with box one to help people understand that the way to have the healthiest uh, and safest pregnancy possible for them is to um, be taking medicines on the go list, which are pregnancy compatible medicines and keeping their lupus activity as low as possible. And that's sort of the overarching uh, component. Box two is helping a woman understand how active her lupus is. So a lot of her patients actually have a really hard time discerning how much lupus activity they have because what they feel is achy fatigue that actually often does not correlate to inflammation. What they don't feel is proteinuria, which as I believe I've shown you, is really the biggest hazard here. 
So people with a fair amount of proteinuria who are feeling good, which is common, think their lupus is well controlled and certainly well enough controlled for pregnancy. And the answer is no, that that is not. We also have women who are really achy fatigued and have the perception that their lupus is exceptionally um, active and therefore pregnancy is off the table. And that is not true. In my experience, those patients do quite well in pregnancy. They are not comfortable. They have a fair amount of pain, but they make through pregnancy quite well. Sometimes actually the achy fatigue gets better in pregnancy. That's not that uncommon. So box three is um, about medications. And we have the medications on the sheet because I don't expect you to remember them. You don't do this nearly as often as I do this. So I do not expect you to remember um, what medicines are safe. Um, so they are on the sheet. Um, you know, I usually circle things as we go. You know, you're already taking hydroxychloroquine. That one should be for everybody. We're talking about maybe doing azathioprine and I circle that one maybe. Um, if people are on uh, things that cause major birth effects, we talk about that at the time. Um, the insufficient information, and I'm sorry, I don't have the version up yet quite from the designer, um, that also includes voclosporin and anafrolimab. These are our newer medications. Um, at this point, you know, it's always a judgment call on whether you use them. Um, in my mind, if they are managing lupus nephritis and stopping them is going to make lupus nephritis a lot worse. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about continuing them. If, um, if it's much less of a high stakes kind of a deal with them, then I'm less um, enthusiastic about them. Um, if say, patients are on a lot of prednisone, then I increase pregnancy compatible medicines. Um, uh, all women with lupus, uh, we treat with aspirin to decrease the risk of preeclampsia, usually starting around the end of the first trimester. And then I get all the rheumatologists off the hook for all the other medicines um, and refer that to the OB who is much better at talking about all the other medicines. In terms of doctors, you know, everybody needs to be involved who's usually involved with the patient. Not everybody needs a nephrologist, obviously. If they have a nephrologist, they need to be involved. I recommend that all our patients with lupus see, patient, see a maternal fetal medicine specialist at least once. If they live very far away and all they've got is a local obstetrician nearby, that local OB um, will feel much more comfortable having had a, a MFM um, at an academic center tell them sort of what the clear guidelines are. But the monitoring activities that happen at the end of pregnancy that the local OB do are actually things that the local OB does all the time. It's just a lot more frequent. And then at the bottom are things that also happen in lupus, pregnancy, antiphospholipid syndrome, row antibodies, high blood pressure, pain, with their very brief guidelines down there at the bottom. So that's the intervention, ask, discuss, share. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a little data from it. So in the Duke Lupus Clinic, we've been doing this for quite a while. We have it, um, the patients actually complete a big long survey about other things. And on there are, you know, do you or your partner want to become pregnant in the next year? Um, and uh, about 17% of our patients pretty consistently of reproductive age say yes. And usually about half of them are not actually medically ready for pregnancy at that point, sometimes because they're taking a teratogen or disease activity. Um, we've looked at how well we then document pregnancy planning in our note, and we're pretty good at it, thankfully. There's um, seven of us in the lupus clinic uh, doing this, so it's not just me. Um, we are continuing pregnancy compatible medicines. We're making sure patients know to stay on their hydroxychloroquine. We're planning switch plans for the people on the teratogen and delaying pregnancy while that's happening. We definitely have work to do with prenatal vitamins and getting people to high risk OB, though we usually only do that when they're really ready to get pregnant. Um, when we look at birth control, um, you know, based on this survey, like how we do it now, all women, we know what all women are doing for birth control, which is a step in the right direction. 37% um, are not using major, or we're not really using any significant birth control of reproductive age, 19% uh, moderately effective, 40%, 44% highly effective. Um, not particularly different if they're on a teratogen or high activity lupus, unfortunately, when we started doing this, but proteinuria, we were doing um, a pretty good job of getting our women with proteinuria on highly effective contraception. These days when um, the gynecologist actually will come and do, um, put in an IUD or lung or an implant in the hospital now, and we have somebody with um, active lupus and nephritis who were starting on mycophenolate in order to get over the problem of getting people into clinic for contraception. We also are doing this funded by the Rheumatology Research Foundation and some private clinics through the RISE registry. And this is one example of a clinic in Florida 
where we have um, inserted these two questions or these questions about pregnancy planning and current contraception. And we have the MAs doing it. And you can see in the last few months, they've gone all the way up to about 60% of patients are getting this recorded. And the forms of birth control you can see here, just like in ours, about 35% are reporting not using any birth control. 15% um, had long acting reversible, 16% had permanent. And we're asking about pregnancy interest, and most of the time it's getting documented. So they're, they're still getting better on getting them documented. But um, interestingly, so we, there's four answers to this question, actually. Not interested, um, yes, interested, unsure if I'm interested, and okay either way. Which as doctors, we don't really think people live like that, right? We're like planners, particularly when it came to pregnancy. But it turns out there's actually people wandering around who are just unsure either way or okay either way. Um, and it's worth us remembering that. So um, yes, you know, is somewhere between five to 10%. And then there's always sort of a couple of people, it seems every month that is, is in this okay either way. In my experience, these are the patients that we miss, the unsure or okay either way, are the people who <clears throat> are neither planning to avoid pregnancy, so they're not on good birth control, nor are they doing anything to actually prepare for pregnancy, like switching their medicines or telling us and plan having pregnancy planning. So these are really important people actually that we pick up. So with that, I just wanna thank my team. Amanda Udi in particular is our lead epidemiologist and she has done an amazing job with all this data. We have a lot of terrific people on our team here. Um, and I always wanna thank the women in the pregnancy registries as well as the lupus registry for their kindness in doing a lot, a lot of surveys and um, teaching me so much over the years. So in conclusion, um, you can help your patients avoid catastrophic pregnancies. First, you just need to identify women at risk and have honest and accurate conversations with them so they can make informed decisions that guide her towards safe and effective contraception and or the plan for the to plan for her possible safest possible pregnancy. And with that, I will take questions. Great. Um, I can read the questions in the chat. Perfect. Um, so this goes back to something you talked about like half an hour ago with one of your slides. But um, mm -hmm. in women with lupus nephritis who have proteinuria but no other evidence of active disease, what is the risk of catastrophic pregnancy outcomes? Yeah, the same high, right? So those are patients that we showed that were people who had over like half a gram or a gram of proteinuria. So even you don't have cells, it's the, yeah we consider those patients at quite high risk for poor pregnancy outcomes, especially for preeclampsia. Almost all of our patients, it seems, transform into preeclampsia at the end. Okay. Um, next question, does the 40% cutoff for risk related to lung disease apply if the low DLCO is from pulmonary hypertension, not from interstitial lung disease? PAH makes me more anxious, but wonder if your data and analysis could clarify. Yeah, it's a great question. We cannot tell the difference because we don't have that many people actually that were in this cohort with pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is probably the most dangerous thing that we could ever see in pregnancy because uh, really like 30% of them die in the weeks following delivery. So um, uh, certainly if somebody has pulmonary hypertension that's driving down their DLCO, they are exceptionally high risk. And those and are pregnancies that we would recommend not happening. So uh, like I let people get pregnant, they are allowed to get pregnant with them with anything they want, right? But people with pulmonary severe pulmonary hypertension, I would strongly discourage from getting pregnant. And I would cite high high maternal death rates, which people find important. And using euphemisms for it um, is not helpful to them, right? They need to know that they're actually personally at very high risk of dying. And if they make that choice, then that's their choice. But they need to know that walking in. Is that 30% um, number? a number of percentage that you said about death after pH, is that for severe only or for all? That's for severe. Severe, okay. Yeah. Um, question about Sherabel, a progestin only oral contraceptive. Question of whether it's safe in patients with history of Libman Sachs endocarditis and antiphospholipid antibodies. I don't know that one. Is that the SLIND? I don't know what that one is specifically, but the the newer one that I've seen does not appear to increase the risk of uh, blood clots as best I could tell. But okay. certainly there's not nearly as much data on that one as other ones, but yeah. Um, one of the challenges I encounter when talking to my patients is telling them when to stop their medications if they do plan to get pregnant, when should they stop them? 
Absolutely. Great question. All right. So um, it varies on the patient, less on the drug. So um, if we think about like methotrexate, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, they all actually have pretty short half-lives in terms of like time that the drug itself is circulating in the woman. So actually just as long as they're pregnant outside of the half-life, then we're good, right? And the half-life is like a day or so, less than, or hours, right? So the official guidelines for methotrexate is one uh, menstrual cycle. So like a month-ish, um, not three months, not six, definitely not 12. I've heard, I've had patients come in and tell me 12. It's like one month. And then for mycophenolate, I think the guideline is six weeks, but that doesn't really have any science behind it. So, but my concern for the method, for the mycophenolate people particularly, is that I want them to switch to a pregnancy compatible medicine. Like they go from methotrexate, or I mean, sorry, they go from mycophenolate to azathioprine plus or minus other things. Um, and I do it as a crossover. Like I don't just stop somebody's mycophenolate and start them on azathioprine because we all know that there will be a window in which they're not immunosuppressed. And azathioprine doesn't always work. Not everybody tolerates it, right? And then you're like two months later and they're not on drug. So I do a crossover. I like decrease people's mycophenolate. I increase their azathioprine. We like watch things. And then, um, so I, uh, and then we I wanna watch people on off mycophenolate entirely for some period of time. And that period of time, and as well as the, how you do the crossover depends on the patient, right? So if she's somebody who hasn't had active lupus in 10 years and she's on 500 milligrams of mycophenolate, you can probably make a pretty fast switch and like have her wait for three or four months. If she had active lupus nephritis a year ago, but she really wants to get pregnant and so you're sort of forcing yourself through this switch earlier than you want to be, then I would have her stay not pregnant off mycophenolate for at least six months if you can talk her into it. Because that, um, I would much have, rather have people flare before they get pregnant than when they're pregnant. Okay, great. Uh, next question, in patients on rituximab, do you time the infusions relative to conception and delivery? Do you alter the usual six month interval? Yeah, um, yes, yeah, so good question. So I do not go by their, um, so, right, so rituximab sometimes comes with a sort of warning that people shouldn't get pregnant in the year after dosing. I think that's not useful information. Um, I do use rituximab now, um, particularly for my patients who fall pregnant with lupus um, who are non-adherent to medicines, which is most of our patients who sort of fall into this active lupus nephritis pregnant situation. So I'm using rituximab in those patients because I can get a drug in their body and then it will stay there for a longer period of time. So my timing on that, so say somebody is on Rituxx every six months, just like at baseline, then um, I just let them go ahead and get pregnant kind of whenever they, they happen to get pregnant. And then um, I time the next dose, ideally sort of mid to end of the first trimester. So what we know about biologics, all biologics, including rituximab, actually all antibodies, is they start crossing the placenta around 16 weeks gestation. So if you give somebody rituximab at 10 weeks gestation, um, you know, by the time they start switching, her level is kind of coming down and you've got plenty of time before delivery when the rituximab will really be gone from the baby and the mother. However, say you dose rituximab at 30 weeks, right? The mom is going to be pushing a lot of Rituxx over to that baby, and the baby is at very high risk for not having B cells. So um, I, at delivery, so I um, much prefer to use Rituxx in the first half of pregnancy. So I'll sort of sometimes go ahead and give it if I think we might need it coming out. Um, and I personally have not given it in the second half of pregnancy at this point. And then um, with all of my biologics, I usually start people back on them quite quickly after delivery, like a week or two after delivery, basically to sort of make sure the mom doesn't have terrible infections from her delivery. Um, and uh, so I would get them back in Rituxx like soon after delivery. And I'm fine with biosimilars as well. I don't make a distinction and I don't find the, the months that you have to argue with insurance companies worth the benefit. We have time for a couple more. Um, how often do you see women with SLE during pregnancy? Do you see them at a certain interval of stable? I assume more often if active. Absolutely. So the ACR guidelines we wrote down that you should see people every trimester. That's sort of a made up number that seemed like a good idea. Um, I see people, it depends on how sick they are. It's rare that I see people more that more infrequently than every 10 weeks. It's 
infrequent that I see people more than every four weeks, <laughs> but there's a pretty big variation between four to 10 weeks, depending on how sick they are, really. Okay, um, can most of the management be done over virtual care and what's the percentage of virtual care in your clinics? Great question. I really like virtual care. We actually had our rheumatology grand rounds about virtual care this morning um, in which he was telling us that everybody hated virtual care, but I like it a lot. And I have found it exceptionally helpful in my pregnancy population because I see patients who are from all across the state. They are women of reproductive age, um, often with children and jobs. And um, it's really hard to come all the way to Duke like three hours away in the middle of the day. And instead they can go sit in the car when they have their lunch break and can talk to me. Um, also, most of my patients who are pregnant are actually doing quite well. And so there's really not a lot of physical exam that really makes a huge difference. Um, also, these people go to the doctor a lot because <laughs> they're seeing their OB. So they can get labs done pretty routinely. And I usually have them have like a lab sheet that they take to their OB in order to get labs done um, easily. And then I can see those or they pull them up on their portal for me or whatever. So I do a lot of telehealth. Um, I've also found it's good for patients. Um, like I can do pregnancy counseling. I did one yesterday, a new patient I'd never seen before with lupus, new lupus, new nephritis. The rheumatologist had talked through it, but really could tell the patient wasn't buying this, like don't get pregnant right now kind of deal. So I went through it with her and her husband. Sometimes I even pull up the website um, on telehealth and like walk through the handout. Like basically I just walked through the handout with you guys. Um, and that helps women um, really make informed decisions. And often they will come to the conclusion themselves like, oh, this would be a bad idea right now. Let's take some you know, relatively easy steps to get where it's gonna be better, right? And often their spouse is there, it's easier for their spouse to be there. So I personally really like telehealth for this. Great. I'm gonna carry a couple of the questions over to the clinical discussion. Um, that link is in the chat. Um, and maybe we'll just take like five minutes break between the two and meet, meet there. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Bye.